encounters with God again in the Bible. Uh, did anybody uh, follow up on the, uh, my uh, homework assignment for uh, watching Bruce Springsteen's version of Dick and Flatter song? We, uh, pretty good. Good, good edition of it. So sometime we'll have to show that to you. Uh, but it's about uh, knowing that through our struggles they make us stronger. As we uh, climb the ladder, so to speak, uh, we learn some things. And so today uh, we have a passage uh, that kind of goes along with uh, what Jacob was saying. Remember, Jacob woke up and uh, he realized, he said, God was in this place and I didn't know it. And so I encourage you to think about your life and the moments in your life when God was present with you and maybe in that moment you weren't aware of it, but later on you look back and said, wow, that was God watching over me or, or giving to me some great gift. That was a special moment. Uh, and so often in our lives, we don't realize when we're having those special moments. And so I talked about uh, the um, church in England uh, that uh, has this um, piece of their worship service where they ask someone from the congregation <clears throat> to provide four pictures from the past week. It's called uh, <clears throat> Four Pictures of My Life. Now, I want you to start thinking about how is it in those pictures if you began to be, what I like to say, mindful about it. If you really thought about the significance of the people in the picture, the reason why you took the picture, uh, how would it be that you would realize that God was with you in that moment and that you learned something very important? Well, today, I want to give you a really great memory verse. And at Romans 8, 28, should have wrote Romans 8 up there, um, we have on our lobby side the scripture for the week ahead, and we have the theme. Uh, and someone uh, was coming out of breakfast the other day, uh, and they said, hey, uh, what's the verse for this Sunday? I said, Romans 8, 28. And uh, automatically that person said, I have that in my wallet. I have it on a card in my wallet. It's uh, such a popular verse. Uh, and as we begin, I want to invite you to join with me in it. Uh, and we'll kind of work through what it means. Join me in this uh, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love God and have been called according to God's purposes. Now, the way I got turned on to this particular passage and the reason why it meant something to me is because of a woman in a former church that I served. Her name was Emma Mann. And Emma had been going through uh, chemotherapy for brain cancer. So I visited her often uh, in her home, and I came to know much about her story. And she was uh, uh, grew up on this farm, uh, and she and her husband worked this farm, but her husband died while she was still trying to raise two young daughters. So instead of giving up and, and moving off the farm, uh, she took over running the farm. Uh, and did very well. But later on, her uh, one of her daughters died at a, at a young age. Uh, she uh, had some problems with the land and some of the business associated with it. Uh, and as I was talking to her about uh, her scripture memory verse, which some of you might know in the evangelical and reform tradition is really important. You know, you really got to know what your memory verse is. She said, Romans 8, 28. And she said that that passage got her through all of the struggles that uh, she encountered in life. She said she holds that memory verse and that confirmation verse in her heart because it's helped her to get through all those things in her life. So I want to ask you this question. You know what this picture is? What biblical story this is? St. Paul, right. St. Paul, this is a road to Damascus story, remember? Now, this is another God story, right? Here, uh, you know, Jacob, ladder, he had a stone for his pillow, he was out in the desert. Uh, Paul was Saul at the time. He was on his way to persecute Christians. Remember that story? And he has this great uh, vision of Jesus, uh, and it was a transforming moment. He was blinded, uh, and uh, he regained his sight. Um, but this is the moment uh, when Paul is on the road to Damascus and 
God meets him. Now, Romans 8.28 is thoroughly consistent with the person that Paul was. If you think about his life, it was a definition of his faith. It was uh, written in the book of Romans, which was probably his last writing. Uh, and uh, he uh, tried to get his most developed thought into it. Now, Paul, does anybody uh, remember any stories from the life of Paul? Any stories at all besides the road? He, he started out, he was persecuting Christians, right? Because he believed that, um, that Judaism uh, was uh, uh, being threatened by this, uh, the teachings of Jesus. What, what else happened to Paul? He traveled all over the place, right? And one of my favorite stories is uh, when he went to Lystra. Now, keep in mind, this was his first missionary journey. And uh, he went into Lystra, and he started speaking, and people didn't like what he was saying about Jews and Gentiles coming together, uh, about uh, bringing people together in, in Jesus. And so they stoned him. They stoned him. And they thought he was dead, actually. So they grabbed him by the feet, they called him out outside the city, they threw him on top of a burning pile. Well, in the morning he woke up. What do you think he did? He got up, he dusted himself off, he walked right back into Leicester. That's the kind of guy Paul was. And that's the guy that wrote these words. He was uh, shipwrecked on an island. He was there with uh, Luke, who, uh, Reportedly uh, ended up writing a gospel. And uh, he reached in for some firewood and there was a poisonous snake in there. It bit him on the hand. And he just shook it off. And Luke, the physician, wanted to take care of him. And he said, no, I'm going to be all right. How many of you have ever done that? <laughs> I don't think I'd do that. He said, yeah, that's good. This is Paul. Paul was whipped everywhere. Paul went. People got angry, and people got mad, because they didn't believe his message of being able to trust, being able to trust people. There's an English theologian called N.T. Wright, and uh, his, uh, his specialty is Paul, and I always like this quote. He said, wherever St. Paul went, there was a riot. Wherever I go, they serve tea. <laughs> Maybe we can say this about the height of the church, right? Have we started a movement yet? Or have we served tea? All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to God's purposes. That's really hard to believe. This really was not an easy thing for Emma Mans to put into practice in her life. Because she faced mortality. She faced loss, death, failures, fears. <clears throat> Throughout human history, can we say that all things work together for good? Yeah, I don't know. It's really pretty amazing. Sometimes when, when, when we see things happening in the world, we don't know what to make of it. And the world is changing at such a fast pace that our morality needs to catch up to it. Our sense of ethics, our sense of brave and vision sisterhood and brotherhood to the world more urgent today than it was then. But I want you to look at the crux of the passage. For those who love God. We always uh, forget what the greatest commandment is. The greatest commandment isn't love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with everything you've got. And each part of our life of faith emerges because we love God. And we are able to do impossible things because we love God. All mission, all fellowship, everything we do is made possible because we don't buy the world's distrust that we believe that it's more important to trust. I've got some images here. Does anybody know who these people are? Oh, boy. <laughs> There's a riot everywhere they go. <laughs> this is as our, my three sons. I guess a movie, wasn't it? Or TV show. <laughs> After I said it, I realized it was a TV show. And it kind of is like that. <laughs> We're in a restaurant. My son uh, in the late color there is living in China. That's the first time he, he was back in about four years. So that was a great picture. And that moment is one of those moments when 
you have that transcendent time and you look back at it and say, you know, God was in this place and we didn't know it. That God loves us enough to touch us and give us those kinds of moments. Now, I want to introduce you to the work of a man named Richard Rinaldi, who is a photographer, uh, who has recently written a book, and he has a website that's called Touching Strangers. Touching Strangers. He grew up in Chicago, moved to New York, and he began his career by photographing the kinds of people that he saw in bus stations across the United States. And I'm just going to flip through some of these, and some of them I know something about, and some I don't. But these are some of the photos in his new book. Now, he said that this is one of the more awkward ones that he had, but what he does is he pulls people who are complete strangers together, uh, together and asks them to do certain things and have their picture photographed. Now, these two guys didn't know one another at all in the city, but he said, hey, why don't you guys stand over there by the wall and I'll take your picture? So these guys are kind of, you know, oh, is it okay? One guy's kind of leaning in. You can see a little discomfort there. But then there's this one. One to a fair, you know, two guys. He said, hey, let me get a picture of you two guys together. And they got a picture by the thing too. None of these people are related. He was going down the street. He was in a parking lot, a grocery store. He pulled these three people over, said, hey, I want you guys to pose together like your family. And so they all came together. You can imagine, I mean, you know, the opponent in the middle is not quite sure. It looks like, right? Uh, and that's the, they say, well, okay. Uh, the guy, kind of straight, wants his picture taken. Look, now this one I wanted to talk about a little bit because this one was 95 years old. And uh, she uh, was a professor and she was walking down the street. Uh, and uh, Rinaldi uh, uh, approached her about being in a photo. And then she, he went over to a basketball court where this guy was playing and called him over and said, I want you to pose in this way together in this photo. Now, if you just saw this photo somewhere, you might think different, right? Because they're two human beings, but because they're called and because they're put together in this setting, they come to care for them. Nobody in that photo is related to one another either. <laughs> Maybe these are four people that he randomly picked out and I can see the boys kind of standing away. I don't know about this, you know, kind of thing. But he's there, and they went along with it. And uh, so he's got all these pictures uh, of these different people he brought together, and he tells the story about what they were doing. And uh, this, these are some of the things that the people said when they were asked how they felt about it. They said, it's sort of awkward but then it's not. We are missing so much about the people around us. The guy who was kneeling said, I came to care for her. And uh, the, uh, the other uh, family picture, someone in that said, it's nice to feel comfort and you belong and you walk away with a good feeling. Now we could ask ourselves, what do all these people have in common? But I don't have to ask that question because I know what they have in common. They're human beings, right? And Rinaldi says, life as it is, humanity as it should be, at least for one fleeting moment. And I've got this, this up here. And uh, so I want to say to you that this was originally the idea of the church, wasn't it? Wasn't that what Paul was doing when he went into the Leicester and he threw rocks at it? Isn't that what we're doing when we have events here in the community? Isn't that what happens anytime we go somewhere? That we're getting people who don't know one another to stand by one another and to realize their common humanity. This is something that's really important in our world today. In our world that wants to divide people. Our world that will say bad things about certain groups of people to get us to believe certain things politically. That's a very dangerous thing to say bad things about a group of people and to make them targets. So this was the original church. And that's what Paul knew from his own experience because he said bad things about Christians. He realized how wrong he was on the road to Damascus. 
And even though he had done all those bad things, he was there when Stephen was stoned. He agreed with all the people who were in the crowd and causing a riot. And all that, even that bad thing that he was involved in worked for good because he realized that we are all humans. So we're called to love God and discover our basic humanity with all people. So we're, we're trying to plan a new worship service, and uh, we're trying to find names for it. We still don't have one, so if anybody's got a good name, it's kind of like come to the table or gather together or thriving church or something like that. It doesn't matter how we live at church, because the thing that we do is remind people who they are and to remind you that life is sacred as it is and not as we would have it. And our theme is embracing and celebrating God's love. So let's join together in uh, this saying of Rinaldi and then our commitment. Humanity as it could be, as most of us think it would be, as it is for one fleeting moment in time, embracing and celebrating God's love, open and affirming local mission. I hear Paul saying that. That could be Paul there. So Ella and I always ask each other, what do you want to be when you grow up? You guys ever ask your spouses that? What do you want to be when you grow up? Because we know that you always have to grow. You always have to change. And growth is vitality. Seeing things different is vitality. Because you're not alive if you're not growing. So what does God want the church to be when the church grows up? Well, we are. We have grown up. We have changed with the times. We have met the needs in the community. We are an open and affirming church. We are a global mission church. And we are that because we know that Jesus welcomed everyone. That Jesus accepted everyone. Because we know that God so loved the world. And the most important thing that a church does is to create community. Because we live in an age of isolation. An age where we don't even know fake news from real news. And the only way you're going to know that is to look somebody else in the eye. And to have a genuine relationship. There's a great uh, passage that I like too. This is from Pat O'Brien, my friend in the Catholic Commission for Social Justice. And this is one of their commitments in their little folder. We are one family, whatever our national, ethnic, and ideological differences, we are our brothers' keepers. It's a commitment. Social justice, Catholic Church. So today, we get back to Romans 8, 28. Let's say it one more time. Maybe you can memorize it like Emma Mann did. You can have it. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love God and have been called according to God's purpose. Now I want to tell you that uh, in 2005, we built a house down in Apple Creek. And you can kind of see that's the star down there. Some of you know Wayne County, you know where Apple Creek is. If not, you can see some of the names on it. Uh, I have an old picture uh, of standing with a shovel in 2005 with that family and two little kids. 2005, okay, this is already 17. I don't know how many of you are counting or not, that was 12 years ago. So those kids lived in that house that we built their whole school years. So there are some great stories that happen because we believe in these things. It's not even because there's a deep need that we go places. Although it's true that there is a deep need. We go because it's fair. We go because we love God and God calls us to be up and about it. A lot of people, when I say we go to Mexico, they go, well, what do you go there for? I don't think people should go overseas. I think they ought to work in their own communities. Why do we go to Mexico? We go there so we can look someone in the eye and find out about their life. Why do we go to Tennessee, someone said. They always ask us, if you, if you do anything that's out of the ordinary, people always ask you why you do it, right? 
Why do you do it? Well, it's not about this one or that one. It's not about saying that this person has a need and that person doesn't. It's about the crazy farmer and the parable of the seed with Jesus. He throws those seeds everywhere. He's not discriminating. It's about Jacob who raked, well, wakes up to the realization that God is in this place and we didn't even know it. So we can never discourage people who are trying to do good because they love God. Got two, two slides. You see, you notice anybody in this picture you don't? Mm -hmm. know quite a few of them. Very sweaty picture. There's a, there was this one guy, man, he was working like a Clydesdale. He got all wet while he was there. He was working so hard. The guy had a green over there. I don't know who he was. Man, that guy was working hard. But I can tell you what. There is a woman named Mabel in Lansing, Tennessee, this morning, who is rocking on a new porch in front of her safe house. And I guarantee you that she is thinking about all of you this morning. Because she is grateful that you provided the spiritual strength for a group from Worcester, Ohio, to go to her and do things that she would not allow others to do. And there was a young man named Trevor down there at the bottom of the screen who didn't understand what we were doing. And yet he worked alongside us and we brought him along. And they wondered why there was a van load of what they called Yankees <laughs> welcoming them to do good for others in their neighborhood. There are at least eight families in Wayne County. 12 in Mexico, who woke up this morning in a home that people from Trinity helped to build. And people are making their way today to a church in God. And they remember that some of you that are sitting in these pews pulled them into the picture with them, the picture of God's grace. There's a church in Borsche, Germany, who will think about us today and pray for us because we are now partners in the Ministry of Reconciliation and refugee resettlement. The world that we live in can be very distrustful, very discouraged. And that was no secret to Paul, because that was the same world he lived in. So we have to trust, and to have courage, and to embrace people, and to be open. All things work together for good, for those who love God and who are called according to God's purposes. So often, God is in this place and we don't know it. So, Richard Rinaldi knows this. Paul knew this. And I hope that your heart today 